Hello, how are you doing? Uh, today, uh, we're going to, uh, it's good for you to be here. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, the Baroque period. Baroque period is a large period, just like with all these periods we've been talking about. We're just talking about a small little part of them. There's so much more to it. Uh, but I'm kind of picking and choosing uh, something that I want to uh, talk about that pertains to the quizzes that we're going to be having and some of the projects that we do in class. So, <clears throat> yeah, I know sometimes <clears throat> things are from a certain perspective. I understand that. Uh, so, we're going to talk about Baroque, the Baroque art period. We're going to talk about Caravaggio, uh, Diego Vasquez, and Rembrandt. Uh, now, as far as the, the quiz that we're taking and, and, and with this, uh, the, the quiz is really going to focus on uh, uh, Diego Vasquez's unusual portrait of the royal family and what's so unusual about that. We're going to talk about that. It's a really cool painting. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, Caravaggio's on the way to Damascus and, uh, and, and what's so unique and important about Caravaggio and what he brings to the table during the Baroque period. And also we're going to talk about Rembrandt. And we're going to talk about Rembrandt's, his ability to use feelings uh, in, in, in a very powerful way in his paintings, uh, probably even more so than the artists we've talked about before. So uh, those are some of the things that we're going to approach a little bit today uh, in what we're doing. And uh, so here we go. So what we'd like to do is deal with Diego Vasquez. Now Diego Vasquez is Spanish, and and Diego Vasquez uh, is is the the father of Spanish art. Uh, Goya is going to honor him. Picasso is going to honor him. Uh, Salvador Dali is going to honor Diego Vasquez. They're all these Spanish artists are always going to look back, back into history, and that Diego Vasquez is just is just uh, a man among artists. And uh, and we're going to talk about one of his paintings today. Uh, this is kind of a really cool painting. He was the court painter for the King of Spain. Okay, so usually the king the king gets the best painter in town. Okay, so here they are, uh, probably in, in Madrid. Uh, the painting is in Madrid in the Prado, and uh, here's a painting of the royal family. And uh, what's what's really really cool about this piece is uh, uh, if uh, if you take a look at at the painting, it's a large painting. And the painting used to be in the gallery uh, where you would, it was in a room where you couldn't see it, but you walked in the room and you saw it through a mirror first. And it had this incredible three-dimensional uh, impression about it. And now it's not like that. Now it's just, in, just in the, on a wall in the museum so more people can see it. Uh, <clears throat> but here you have the royal family and it's really a cool painting. So here's a painting of the king and queen and their daughter, the maids of honor. And you kind of looking and say, where's the king and queen? Who's the daughter? And what's going on here? So when you look at this painting, this large painting, the painting, Diego Vasquez, the painter, is right here. So you see Diego Vasquez, and this canvas right there is the canvas that's being painted. It's the canvas we're looking at. So he's basically looking in a mirror and painting what's beside him. But what he's doing is he's painting a portrait of the king and queen from their perspective. As they're standing there being painted, this is what they see. If you were being painted, you would see the artist looking out from behind the canvas and you'd see the back of the canvas if you were being painted. So here you see the artist with the paint palette back of the canvas and the artist is looking at you, painting you. And you're looking at your daughter right there in front of you. So it's a portrait of the king and queen, but from their perspective, not one of them. But if you look here in the back of the room, there's a mirror. And in that mirror, you see the king and queen. So it actually is a painting of the king and queen. Here, 
from their point of view. And again, when you see this through a mirror, it has a really weird three-dimensional look about it. And the idea that Diego Vasquez is in the painting with the canvas is something that all those other Spanish artists, when they do a painting, occasionally they're gonna put themselves in the painting just like Diego did here uh, in honor of him. Okay, Caravaggio. Caravaggio is going to, again, he's, he's gonna be on that bandwagon of Tintoretto that is just breaking the rules of, of the Renaissance as far as composition. Uh, asymmetrical. Now here, you, know, you have uh, the crucifixion of St. Peter. He was crucified upside down. And um, so you, you, you have, you know, a third of the painting here on this triangle. You have a, a, a swatch going through here, then you have another third of it down here. That composition would have never been done during the Renaissance or even really even during the manners time, really. But, uh, but this becomes a, a very, very uh, different way of, of dealing with composition and painting with Caravaggio. But Caravaggio, he uses a lot of lights and darks. He uses light very powerfully. But he also, the way that he he paints the human skin and the body. It's just, just the way that he molds it and the way that he paints it. Uh, it's just absolutely uh, beautiful and looks very, very realistic when he does it. Uh, this piece right here, I don't have a very good picture of it. Uh, this is John the Baptist. Uh, this is at the Nelson Art Gallery. That's why I'm kind of showing you because when you go to the Nelson Art Gallery, you can see Caravaggio. Uh, there's, there's not very many Caravaggios in the world. Uh, uh, Caravaggio, uh, passed away at a, a fairly young life in his 30s. Very, very controversial, uh, kind of a bizarre uh, personal life and, and uh, apparently like died in a sword fight. So uh, kind of a swashbuckling type guy. Uh, but uh, he had, he had some, some deals, things they had to deal with and had some problems and just dealt with them and uh, summons to his death. But uh, here he's there's very few Caravaggios outside the United States. There's some here and there a little bit, but uh, you don't see them very much. But this is John the Baptist. Again, I wish I had a better picture of it. When you see, when you see this one in person at the Nelson Art Gallery, it's just the dark, the light, the skin, the shadows, uh, the forehead, the eyes, the shadows. It just has this, this piercing, beautiful look about it. And then we have here, the road to Damascus, I really, I think this is his best painting, uh, uh, Caravaggio. <coughs> uh, uh, here you have uh, the story of a Saul in the New Testament after the after Christ is dead, and you have the New Testament when the apostles are being killed and the, and the Christians are being killed. Uh, millions of Christians are killed in, the, in 300 years of the Roman Empire after Christ's death, and. Uh, and, and Saul was a Pharisee, and he was a Roman soldier, a Pharisee, and he uh, didn't like the Christians. And uh, he was one of the chief persecutors of the Christians and had a lot to do with a lot of people dying. So he was uh, greatly feared in the, in, the, in the church. So here you have Saul, <coughs> and Saul is traveling to Damascus. And, and what happened was Saul receives a vision. And the vision of Jesus Christ, uh, the light is so bright, uh, the vision is so poignant that it knocks him off his horse. So he's knocked off his horse. Uh, he's 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 deaf. I mean, he can't speak. He's mute. He's he, he can hardly see. Uh, the light's bright. But here you see, he's having a vision right here. To us, he's just laying there. But in his mind, what he's seeing, he's seeing this, this vision of Jesus Christ. And at this point, he is converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, becomes a Christian, and he changes his name to Paul. And this is the Apostle Paul, who writes about a third of the New Testament. So from, the, from this event all the way to about uh, AD 95, 98, almost 100 years, something after that even, uh, that he is going to do most of the writings, you know, Corinthians and Revelation, a lot of the other writings in the last, last, part, of the, last part of the New Testament. And uh, what I love about this is that here he's knocked off his horse, he's fallen forward, his body is falling backwards and so beautifully painted. When you see this painting, it looks like his body is literally falling off the canvas. You know, it's good life size, probably a little larger than life size. It's just like this body is just 
tumbling off the wall. And it's just very, very, very spectacular. And Caravaggio does that in just a beautiful uh, ex 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 expert way. Here's that body just kind of coming off. There's a lot of symbolism and things going on here too. Okay, now we have Rembrandt. Rembrandt had an interesting life. Uh, Rembrandt <coughs> uh, was very popular during his time and made lots of money. He spent a lot of money uh, in his younger days, you know, get married, have a, before he's married and after he's married, I just had a lot of fun, uh, partied a lot, spent a lot of money, fancy clothes, fancy house, things like that. And, and, and Rembrandt <clears throat> was just absolutely brilliant at drawing. Uh, Rembrandt, a uh, young artist, he can sketch and draw. Like here you have this elephant right here. I don't know how long it took him to draw this, but Rembrandt would like draw this in two minutes, maybe. He would do these drawings like this, maybe in a minute, just very, very quick. He, he was a master at gesture drawing. Uh, that's how I teach drawing. Uh, if, I if I teach you how to do drawing, I, I, I have a, a program for a couple of years that I deal with uh, that teaches gesture drawings that you draw things very, very rapidly. When you do that, you have the movement, uh, you have the proportions right. Uh, you, it's, it's a way of getting things right. Uh, if you start, if you're, drawing, you're going to draw someone, you start at the top of their head, you take an hour to draw it. By the time you go to the head, the neck, the shoulders, the body, usually it's out of proportion. and It doesn't have the energy and it doesn't have the movement to it. So Rembrandt was just unbelievable uh, at, at doing this. Uh, very, very few artists are good at this. You'll see that Leonardo da Vinci is like this. Michelangelo definitely is like this. Andrew Wyeth, uh, you know, some years you know, in the 20th century was like this. Uh, but there's artists that are just, just, just incredible at gesture drawing, and he was very good at that. He was very, very skilled at etching. Uh, etching was just uh, an incredible uh, art form. Etching is when you take a, they take a metal plate and on that metal plate, they put, I'm going to say, to make a longer story short, you, they put tar on it and then you get a sharp needle and you stylus and you scratch the tar off the metal plate. You do that multiple times. Then you take the metal plate and you put it in acid and the acid won't eat away the tar but the acid will eat away the metal where you scratch the tar away and it digs into the metal plate. So you clean the tar off, then you put ink on it and you rub the ink into the cracks and then you get a piece of paper. Then you get a piece of paper. You get this a metal plate with tar in the cracks, but not on the surface. And then you put the piece of paper on it and you run it through a press rollers and at 30,000 pounds per square inch, those rollers roll onto that and it actually pushes the paper into the cracks and it picks up the ink. And then you have a print. And what you do is you can use like a what he did wood blocks also, but when you do wood blocks, uh, they deteriorate very rapidly. You can only do so many. But uh, with a metal plate and etching, you can do maybe a thousand pieces, two thousand pieces. And then, so if you know someone that's writing a book and they need a, a piece of artwork for it, you can just mass produce uh, for this etching and then you can give it to the printer and he inserts those into the books. So he was just a master at etching. He also was one of the, the Dutch masters. I'm sorry, I told you he, he's Dutch. And uh, he's one of the great Dutch masters uh, during this period. And the Dutch masters were known for their group portraits. And this is uh, called the Night Watch, even though it really isn't a Night Watch, but it's called the Night Watch. And that's a long story there. But anyways, when you did a group portrait, uh, the artist would go there and let's say this, this is a veterans group. And you go to this group and they want their portraits painted for their meeting hall. So they want this big portrait painted for all the guys that fought in the war together, you know. But what happens is some of them have money and some don't have money. So what happens is usually the guy that's got the most money, he's front and center. And he's got some money. He's got some money, a little bit more, less money, less money. But then when you have people that don't have a lot of money, uh, like this guy right here, 
he's sitting there and this guy's arm is right in front of his face. So he probably didn't give any money to the, to the painting. And they get, as they get more obscure to the back, usually less money they put toward it. But this was very, very popular in the Netherlands uh, <clears throat> during the, the 1600s. Now, again, we talked about Rembrandt, had money, had a happy life. And it's been a while since I've read his life story. And I, I, I don't remember exactly the sequence, but you know, he had a wife and, 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 the, and they had the child that died in childbirth or maybe a second one died in childbirth. Uh, then they, and they had a son, Titus, this is Titus and he lived and then but his wife died and his wife died and then he uh, got together with another woman and their child died and she died and anyways but uh, all the women he was with and all the children he was with died except for Titus and Titus lives to be a young man uh, probably late teenage years and then Titus dies so here you have Rembrandt who is racked with this incredible pain of everybody around him dying so what happens in his last part of his life, he becomes a recluse. Uh, he doesn't care about money anymore. He doesn't care about paying his bill. He actually files bankruptcy twice. Uh, he could paint and give and sell paintings and have all the money he wants. Uh, matter of fact, when Rembrandt dies, he's going to have over 400 paintings in his home and in his barn, just stacked up. He could just sell half of those and all the money that he wanted to do, but he doesn't care about the money anymore. Uh, what he does is he, he's an incredibly skilled artist like I've been talking about. That's why I showed you those other pieces. He's a very, very skilled artist. And now he has this, 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 this strong uh, torment in his life uh, of feelings. Uh, and, and this is a painting of Titus before Titus dies. So here we got an individual that when he paints, he doesn't have to show someone screaming to show someone angry. He doesn't have to show someone crying to show that they're sad. He doesn't need to show these feelings that are written on their forehead. When you look into the eyes of a Rembrandt portrait, usually looking right at you, you're the viewer and they're staring right at you. And you look at this face right here. This is a self-portrait. And by the way, when he died, there was like 105, 104 self-portraits in his home. He didn't have anybody, he didn't know anybody else really to do. So he would just, he would paint himself. Uh, he was a, he was there. He looked in the mirror and paint himself. So you have these, these brilliant paintings of, uh, of, of, of himself and other people. Uh, very loose, very quick brush strokes. Uh, his the brush strokes got quicker and quicker with the gesture drawing. He, he drew very rapidly, so he'd paint very rapidly. That layer the paints uh, in just an expert way. That just shows you just an incredible amount of depth. Not depth only in the form, but depth in the feelings and the emotions of the piece. Now, so he becomes very good at this. So now I want to talk about a few pieces. This is a picture of Christ that he painted. And it's just, it's just wonderful. You see this painting of Jesus Christ and, and it's just, you just see those layers of feelings and emotions. What is he thinking about? What, what parables going on? What's going on in his head? What is he thinking about? What is he about to say? And, and he does, it's just, just a wonderful portrait here. Uh, but he's able to dig down into just a plain face and have just layers of feelings and emotions and meaning there, which is just brilliant for him. Okay, now there's a, a couple of paintings I want to talk about. This one uh, before I get done here. This is Moses. Now Moses, uh, Rembrandt does a lot of Old Testament pieces, and Rembrandt does a lot of old Jewish stories. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's because the, the the Jewish people in the Netherlands had money with banking and business. But uh, he did a, a lot of uh, Old Testament stories, a lot of Jewish stories. And here we have Moses. Moses comes out of uh, Egypt with the Israelites after hundreds of years. He brings them from, from bondage. Uh, they, uh, they cross the Red Sea. They go into the wilderness. And, and here you got uh, Moses. Uh, the Israelites are happy. They're being faithful. 
and and Moses wants to give them the law of God. So Moses goes up the mount, and when Moses goes up the mount, he leaves his brother Aaron in charge. Aaron has been Moses's mouthpiece for all these years. Moses trusted Aaron explicitly. Okay, he leaves him in charge. So what happens is you have Moses going up the hill, the mount, and he leaves Aaron in charge. Well, when he goes up the hill, uh, Aaron can't keep people from turning. Uh, they go to their old ways of, of uh, idol idolatry, and, uh, and they start partying and carrying on and breaking all the rules. They become, uh, they start doing bad things. So Moses comes down off the mount with the law of God, and you know, in the movies with Charleston Heston, uh, he, he's down there, he's angry, and he, and he throws the tablets at the golden calf, and they blow up, and he's mad, and he's angry. Arr. And that's how most people think about it. But if you read the Old Testament, that's not what happens here. What happens is Moses comes down off the mount with the law of God, that God wants the people to live by this law of God. And he goes down there, and he sees what's going on. And the first thing he does is he turns to his brother, Aaron, and says, Aaron, how can you do this to me? Moses is heartbroken because of what's happened. Here's a Moses holding the law of God. He's not angry. Look at his face. Moses, he's crying. He's upset. He takes the law of God and he smashes it because the Israelites are not worthy of it. Aaron's not worthy of it. And what he does, he goes back up the mount, he gets the Ten Commandments, he gets the Law of Moses, and that is what they're going to live by now, because they can't handle the Law of God. Now, Christ will come later and bring that Law of God, instead of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Now it's love that neighbor, you know, don't judge one another. Those sorts of things are going to come later. So, uh, so that's a very emotional time for Moses, and he's realizing what's happening, uh, and these and the people that he saved from out of bondage in, Israel, in Egypt. And so Moses does this. I mean, Rembrandt does this great job of taking something that is really, really emotional, and and just making a wonderful painting here. Just a powerful, powerful painting here, because he's got the skill to do it. And he's got the knowledge, he does that. And this is my favorite Rembrandt uh, painting. Uh, this one right here, when people see this, they, they, they really don't know this painting that well. Some people do, but it's not a flamboyant painting. Uh, this painting here is of a New Testament. It's from the New Testament Redemption chapter. And the Redemption chapter deals with uh, the 99 and one sheep of Christ, the 10 coins, the woman with the 10 coins, and the return of the prodigal son. Uh, each of those stories in the redemption chapter are, are stories uh, from Christ uh, exemplifying the fact that everyone has equal value and wealth, uh, value and worth in the eyes of God in this world. And I think those are important stories uh, to tell. And I think this is one of the most important stories in the whole Bible. Uh, here you have a situation where you have a father, he's got money, and he has two sons. He gives each of their son their inheritance. One, the, the good son, let's call him, he, he keeps his money, stays home, he works hard, and he multiplies his talents and the things that he has. He's doing very, very good with it. The other son, woohoo, I got my money. So he takes off and he parties hardy and has a great time, spends it on all kinds of things uh, that he shouldn't be spending the money on, wastes all his money, has no more money. Uh, he's poor, destitute, hardly got any clothes, food, or anything. He's got nothing else, so he comes back to his father. And his father, he kneels down, he hugs him, and he welcomes his son back into the home. And then he gives him his inheritance again. No, well, the older son, the other son's going, wait, 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 wait that's not fair. I did good and I'm not being rewarded. He didn't do good and he's being rewarded. And the idea of the story is that it doesn't matter if you're good or if you're bad. God still loves you and he sees you equal, that all mankind are 
equal in the eyes of God. And that's an important story. I think it's an important story for all time. So what's interesting here, though, is Rembrandt is on his deathbed. Some people say he didn't quite finish the painting because he died. So Rembrandt is now, his family is all dead. They've been dead for years. He's mourned his family for all these years. And he especially is mourning his son, Titus. That's who he really, really misses in his world. That's what was so devastating to him. It was Titus that was devastating. So here you have a situation where before he dies, he does a painting of the father and his son is returned to him and he will give everything he has to his son if he can see him again. And Rembrandt writes in his writings before he dies, he says, I do this painting because I hope that there's life after death, that there's a God. And I hope that if that's true, that I'll be reunited with my family again, and I'll be reunited with my son, Titus. And when you think about the skill that Rembrandt had, the ability he had, uh, the paintings that he did, the, the wonderful insight that he had, of feelings and emotions and the way that he rendered that, it just makes us a very, very powerful painting. Now, if you don't know anything about Rembrandt, you don't know anything about this painting, you see this in the museum, the Hermitage, you just walk right by it. And that's what's so important to talk about and to learn about these things. Because the people that know and understand this painting are going to start, they're going to stop there and they are going to feel this incredibly powerful feeling that Rembrandt uh, at the end of his life is going to portray into this painting. And it's an absolute wonderful thing to, uh, to witness. So here we have Rembrandt. And you look at him, you can feel it, you can see it, and hopefully you begin to understand it as you continue to study and you do things. And you can see how powerful and how wonderful uh, of a great painter that Rembrandt is during the Baroque period, the Dutch painter, Rembrandt. So therefore, we'll talk today uh, about Rembrandt's ability, uh, the background, his skill to bring feelings and emotions to, to artwork. We'll talk about Diego Vasquez and his ability to, uh, and his, the painting of the, of the Maids of Honor and uh, how unique that was. And we're going to talk about that in later, later things also. And also about Caravaggio and how he painted the human form so uniquely and so beautiful. And he broke rules and traditions of the Renaissance and gives us compositions that are just absolutely wonderful. And um, yeah, I think that pretty much does it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that and uh, I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you again. Okay, bye.